Mr. President. The Senator from Pennsylvania. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I rise this morning <clears throat> to speak about the legislation that we'll be uh, considering this afternoon. Uh, specifically, I, uh, my understanding is we'll be voting uh, on a procedural measure which will allow us to take up legislation that is commonly known as auditing the Fed, and I wanted to uh, address this. Um, let, me, let me start with um, the context uh, of that, that, that I think uh, is important to think about when we consider whether or not we ought to change the relationship, even modestly, that exists between Congress and the Fed. And it starts for me with a simple observation that the financial crisis of 2008 is over. It actually ended a long time ago. It's been a number of years now that our financial system and our economy has not been in the imminent crisis meltdown mode that it was in in the fall of 2008. In fact, for several years now, we've had meager, but we've had some economic growth. Our banking system has been massively recapitalized. There is no current or imminent wave of bankruptcies in any segment of the economy, really. And yet, despite the fact that we are clearly not in a financial or economic crisis, we have crisis-era monetary policy, policy from the Fed that one would expect to occur presumably only in a crisis. And, and the recent very, very modest change in Fed policy, the movement in the Fed funds rate from a target of zero to 25 basis points to 25 to 50 basis points, is, is arguably the most modest tightening in Fed history. You couldn't even begin to suggest that this is a tightening of monetary policy. This is just a very slightly less easy money policy. That's what we have. So, in my view, there are huge dangers and problems that are associated with the Fed pursuing this completely unprecedented and, I would say, radical experiment in monetary policy. And I want to talk about a few of those um, this morning, Mr. President. And, and one of the first and clearest uh, problems is because the Fed has kept interest rates so low for so long, the Fed has caused a big misallocation of resources. This undoubtedly caused asset bubbles that are existing today that would not have occurred had it not been for the abnormal monetary policy. Take, for instance, sovereign debt markets. In many, many countries, especially in Europe, we have debt issued by governments, and the return on those instruments is negative. In other words, it doesn't cost the government money to borrow money, which is normal. You have to pay interest to borrow money normally. In fact, the government gets paid to borrow money, which is ridiculous and extremely abnormal. And it's happened in the United States. Not at the moment, but in recent history, as a result of this Fed policy, we've had the bizarre world of negative interest rates. Uh, that's just one category that um, clearly has been in a bubble. Uh, most observers believe that the high yield market, the junk bond market, was in a bubble. That's, that's gone through a very turbulent time and a big sell-off, arguably some of the years coming out of that bubble, but who knows. There's been uh, considerable speculation that there are real estate bubbles, other financial assets. This is inevitable when the Fed distorts monetary policy. And it's a disturbing echo of the distortion that occurred back in the early part of the very beginning of this century when the Fed's extremely low monetary policy, very low interest rates, contributed to a housing bubble, which of course ended up collapsing in the financial crisis. But that's just one category of problems the Fed causes with these ultra-low interest rates. A second, of course, is the corollary that people who have saved money and want to invest in a low-risk investment are completely denied an opportunity to get a return. The savers are forced to, as it, the expression is, to reach for yield, which is to say, take your money out of the bank and buy something else because you're earning nothing with the bank. Well, you know what? For a lot of people, a savings account at the bank 
is appropriate for their circumstances, for their risk tolerance. But they're driven away from that because bank deposits yield pretty much zero. Consider the case of maybe an elderly couple that lives in Allentown, Pennsylvania, worked their whole lives, saved whenever they could, sacrificed, chose not to squander their money. They lived modestly rather than lavishly, and they did it in the expectation that when they retired, this nest egg that they had worked for decades to build, this savings account at the bank, was going to yield a little bit of income to help them make ends meet in their retirement, to help supplement whatever Social Security and whatever pension they might have. Well, what we've done to those folks, and they're all over America, who spent a lifetime living prudently, carefully, sacrificing savings, we've said, well, you made a huge mistake because the government is making sure that you earn nothing on those savings. Joseph Stiglitz is a very respected economist. His research has demonstrated that this zero interest rate and quantitative easing, as it's described, this Fed monetary policy, has contributed significantly to expanding income and wealth inequality. It's really not a surprise. This uh, Fed policy has been pretty good for stocks. Stocks prices have gone up, generally. It's been terrible for people with a bank account. Well, wealthy people have a lot of money in stocks. People of much more modest means tend to have more of their money sitting in a savings account, which, as I just described, earn zero. So it's exacerbated the income inequality problem. In addition, what the Fed has been doing has encouraged fiscal irresponsibility here in Washington. What the heck? If borrowing is free, which it basically has been for the federal government, why not run big deficits and borrow lots of money? That's an attitude that some people have. And it frankly diminishes the pressure on Congress to pursue sensible and responsible monetary policy. When the Fed is willing to just buy up all the debt and buy it at an extremely low interest rate, it encourages irresponsible behavior. And now, of course, because the Fed, federal government has accumulated this mountain of debt, $18 trillion now, if and when interest rates return to something like normal, which one day they will, whether the Fed likes it or not, then that's a devastating problem for our budget outlook. So all of this is particularly disturbing to me when you consider that this massive creation of money, this flooding the world with dollars that the Fed has engaged in, does not create wealth. There's a difference between money and wealth. So people, some people might feel wealthier when they see the stock prices rise if they have stocks. But that can be a very artificial phenomenon. It's an inflation in asset prices. It's not an improvement in productivity. It's not an expansion in our economic output. It's not actual wealth. It's numbers on a piece of paper. And of course, what the Fed is able to inflate in this artificial means by creating lots of money, well, that can eventually deflate. And whatever good they think they were accomplishing on the way up, why should we think that we couldn't see the reverse on the way back down? Um, here's what I think is the fundamental problem, Mr. President. The fact is, we have factors that are holding back our economy that are very real and very important. And the Fed's monetary policy can't correct that. So we have a tax code that's completely uncompetitive. It discourages work, it discourages savings, it discourages investment, it makes us less competitive than countries around the world that have more sensible tax codes than we have. We need to fix the tax code. Monetary policy can't make up for a badly flawed tax code. We have unsustainable entitlement programs. They are the ultimate drivers of large and growing deficits, and we will not be on a sustainable fiscal path until we fix these programs and monetary policy can't make up for the cloud that they cast over our economy. We have a declining percentage of Americans who are participating in the workforce. This is a huge problem for us. 
And again, monetary policy does nothing about that. And finally, we have been overregulating this economy on a completely unprecedented scale. The massive wave of overregulation that this administration and and some occasions Congress have uh, has uh, inflicted on our economy clearly contributes a great deal to the subpar economic growth that we've been living through. Again, monetary policy doesn't reverse that, doesn't change that. And it seems to me that despite all their good intentions, their intentions themselves were flawed in that the Fed seems to be trying to compensate for the flawed policy in these other areas. And Mr. President, given the the magnitude and the persistence and the dangers of pursuing this kind of monetary policy, I think it's time that Congress reassert its authority over monetary affairs. So the Constitution clearly gives Congress the responsibility to mint coins and to print money. In 1914, Congress delegated the management of that exercise, the management of our currency, to the Fed. And for a long time, there was a sense that we ought to just leave them to their own devices and not pay very much attention. I think those days are past. I think the Fed has, uh, the Fed's behavior obligates us to take a different approach. One good beginning step would be the legislation that we're considering today. The legislation that would audit the Fed, all it really does is it would give Congress the opportunity to end and the American people the opportunity to examine and understand the mechanics, the thinking behind changes in monetary policy in something close to real time. I think we absolutely need that. Um, and I will say, I was a skeptic about this. For a, lot of time, for a long time, I thought, eh, I'm not so sure it's such a good idea to have Congress looking closely over the shoulders of the folks who are making monetary policy. But I think that the dangerous behavior that the Fed has engaged in for years now means that they have squandered the right to be independent. We need to have more supervision. I think a next step that would be very important would be for Congress to require the Fed to adopt a rule that would govern monetary policy. I'd prefer that we let the Fed decide what that rule should be, and if circumstances require it, in the opinion of the Fed, they ought to be able to deviate from that rule, but they should come and explain to the American people and to Congress when and why they're deviating, rather than have year after year of this bizarre, unnatural policy that is very hard to explain and understand. So, Mr. President, I'm going to support the legislation we're considering this afternoon, the Audit the Fed bill. It is one of many important steps that we can take to restore the accountability that the Fed ought to have. Um, it's important that we get on a different path with our monetary policy. I understand that's not going to occur overnight, and that's not going to occur entirely as a result of this legislation. But um, this policy has been going on too long, and it's time for Congress to reassert its authority. And I yield the floor. The Senator from Nevada. Thank you, Mr. President. I come to the floor today to offer my strong support for the legislation that we're debating today that would finally audit the Federal Reserve. Since I came to Congress, I have supported auditing the Fed, and when I was first elected to the House of Representatives, I would attend briefings hosted by Congressman Ron Paul, Senator Paul's father, and I learned why more accountability and transparency was needed at the Fed. I remember talking to Congressman Paul on the, on the House floor about various issues at the Fed, and that's when I started to support this bill to audit it, just as I'm supporting his son's bill today. I want to thank Senator Paul for continuing to take up the cause and for building the momentum to audit the Fed that has led us to where we are today. Mr. President, since its founding, the Federal Reserve has often operated in secrecy, even though it's is the biggest influence on our country's economy, and the Fed's actions affect every American family and their hard-earned income. 
I'm fortunate to be chairman of the Economic Policy Subcommittee of the Senate Banking Committee, where I have direct oversight over the Federal Reserve's monetary policies, and I can tell you that the Federal Reserve's actions warrant passage of this legislation. For several years, we've seen unprecedented monetary and regulatory policies coming from the Fed. One of the riskiest policies I've ever seen is the Fed's stimulus program of quantitative easing. The Federal Reserve essentially turned on their computers, fired up their electronic printing presses, created new money out of thin air, and started to buy assets. Now you may be asking yourself, how big is this stimulus program? And it's an unbelievable number. As of today, it is nearly $4.5 trillion. And let me say that again, $4.5 trillion, and that's with a T. That's more than four times the cost of President Obama's, President Obama's own failed stimulus program. And who is benefiting from this quantitative easing? And I can tell you in two words, it's Wall Street. That's right, Wall Street hit the jackpot because the Fed's easy money policies drove everybody into the equities market to get any return they possibly could on their investments. Wall Street won and Main Street lost. Savers lost and workers lost. The scary part is the Fed won't rule out buying more assets in the future. And if you ask the Fed today, when or how are they gonna to begin to reduce this $4.5 trillion balance sheet, there's nothing but silence. Is that being transparent? Is that accountability? No, absolutely not. And this is just one of the reasons why we must pass this bill to audit the Fed. I find it ironic that the Federal Reserve is so opposed to being audited because they themselves go around auditing lending institutions all the time. I'm frequently hearing from community lenders out of Nevada who have either the Federal Reserve, the FDIC, the National Credit Union Administration, or the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau knocking on their door all the time. These community lenders did not cause the financial crisis, yet they are the ones that are feeling the, bl the brunt of all these audits. Why should there be a double standard? That the government agencies can examine every American's bank account, but the American public can't examine those same agencies back. Again, this is why we must pass this legislation to audit the Fed. I want to remind my colleagues that even though most of the news about the Fed revolves around interest rates and the Fed's monetary policy, the Fed is also responsible for major regulations that touch almost every aspect of our financial system. Now, I support reasonable regulations, but only after thoughtful and careful evaluations. I think it should be mandated that the Feds conduct a cost-benefit analysis of all of their proposed regulations and always allow public comment on these proposed regulations. I'm also very concerned that the Fed is getting involved in financial sectors that they have not been in the past. We have a long tradition here in the United States of having a time-tested and effective state-based insurance regulatory system. Unfortunately, Dodd-Frank has changed all that, and now the Federal Reserve has new authority over the insurance sector. Right now, as we speak, the Fed is attempting to regulate capital standard requirements for insurance companies in the United States. This will be the first time the federal government opposes, imposes domestic federal capital standards on the state-regulated insurance in industry. I've worked very hard to ensure bank-centric standards are not inappropriately applied to the insurance industry by the feds. But not only does the fed want to add their own domestic layer of rules on top of state-based insurance regulations, they even want another layer of one-size-fits-all in international insurance capital standards on top of that. Now, Mr. President, I almost have to laugh because it's only in Washington, D.C., where a federal agency puts the trailer in front of the horse. Unfortunately, that's exactly what the Fed is doing by working on international capital standards before they complete their own domestic standards. I have serious concerns about these international efforts, and together with Senator Tester of Montana, we introduced the Bipartisan International Insurance Capital Standards Accountability Act, which would compel the Federal Reserve and Treasury Department to complete a study on the impacts on consumers and markets in the U.S. before supporting any international proposal or international insurance capital standard.
Mr. President, these are just a few of the examples of some of the Fed's questionable actions. And as I said earlier, this legislation to the audit the Fed is critical to bring transparency and accountability to the Fed, but even more fundamental changes need to be made to the Fed. A few months ago, Chairman Shelby put together an impressive bill that the Senate Banking and Housing Committee passed, with my support, which would make important reforms to the Fed. One provision would establish a commission to study the potential restructuring of the districts of the Federal Reserve System. Chairman Shelby's bill would also require the Fed's Open Market Committee to make more frequent and detailed reporting requirements to Congress and increase transparency by reducing the time lag for Federal Open Market Committee transcripts from five years to two. These are very reasonable changes that I think Democrats and Republicans alike can support, and I hope that Chairman Shelby's bill will be brought to the Senate floor soon. Mr. President, the Federal Reserve recently celebrated its 100th anniversary. And in many aspects, the, Fed, the Feds have not changed much since Woodrow Wilson's time. As most of us know, a few months ago, we cut a very specific dividend that banks receive for buying stock of the Federal Reserve System in order to pay for the highway bill. While the debate mostly centers on how much to cut the div dividend, I was trying to figure out why the Federal Reserve requires banks to buy these so-called stocks to begin with. After all, it doesn't look like the Fed is in desperate need of funds because over the past half dozen years, Feds have sent nearly a half a trillion dollars in profits to the U.S. Treasury. A hundred years ago, these stock purchases and dividends were meant to incentivize banks to join the Federal Reserve System. Since that time, laws have been passed that essentially don't give a bank the choice as, whether or not, as to whether or not they want to be supervised by the Federal Reserve System because, by law, the Fed has gained authority over all banks that are eligible for FDIC insurance. Just because something was the standard practice over 100 years ago doesn't mean it's still needed today. And I think it's time for Congress to review and examine these Federal Reserve membership requirements even further. To my colleagues, it's essential that Congress exercise its constitutional responsibility to conduct oversight and scrutinize the Federal Reserve in an open and transparent way, which is why I proudly vote today to move forward with auditing the Fed and encourage my colleagues to join me. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor. President. Senator from Ohio. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I rise today to speak uh, to the legislature in opposition to S-2232, the Federal Reserve Transparency Act. I'm concerned that out of all the issues before the Senate, of all the things we need to work on in terms of job growth, in terms of ISIS, in terms of wage inequality, uh, in terms of transportation and so many other issues, uh, that this is the first bill that, that the Senate considers um, in the beginning of the year. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I'm talking a moment about the direction we should go into, but I want to talk about this issue. Not, we're not talking, as I said, about national security or job creation or college affordability, student debt, immigration. My time in Ohio over the past several weeks, people talk to me about all kinds of different issues that Congress should be addressing. but it, frankly comes to no surprise to anybody watching or to any of my colleagues that not one person came up to me and said, you know, Congress needs a greater say in monetary policy. Uh, there is no demand for that except from those who want to score political points. There's no reason for this. There's no legitimate public function that, that we should even do this legislation, the Federal Reserve Transparency Act, and don't be, don't be fooled by the name of the bill because it really isn't about transparency. It's about the Federal Reserve, but not about transparency. But let me, let me move on. Federal Reserve Chair Janet Yellen recently wrote to Senate leaders and copied all of us in the Senate and spoke to the central problem with this legislation. Here's what she said. This bill risks undoing the steady progress that has been made on the economic recovery over recent years in an environment with low and stable inflation expectations. Congress that was made, progress that was made in part because the Federal Reserve 
is able to make independent decisions in the longer term economic interest of the American people. Audit the Fed legislation, the name that people use for this bill, would undermine the independence of the Federal Reserve and likely lead to an increase in inflation fears and market interest rates, would lead to a diminished status of the dollar in global financial markets, would mean increased debt service costs for the federal government and reduce economic and financial stability. Secretary Jan Janet Yellen, the chair of the Federal Reserve, is exactly right. Uh, this legislation is about 535 members of Congress getting involved in federal monetary policy. I can't imagine that the American people want a Federal Reserve where Congress uh, is so involved that, that it's disruptive, that it's become so political, and that's really what this is all about. It's about uh, a, a handful of members of the House and Senate who want to govern monetary policy in a way that, that ultimately won't work in the public interest. It's about their political talking points. It's about all of that. Let's go back. When, when President Obama took office, and you'll hear a little about this, I assume, in tonight's speech and down the hall in the House of Representatives, uh, our country was losing about 800,000 jobs a month when he took office. In February 2010, when we did the Recovery Act and the auto rescue by February 2010, we have seen job growth for about 69, 70, 71 straight months since the auto rescue. I know what the auto rescue have meant in my state. I know we now see an auto industry that's doing very, very well, uh, and we see a whole lot more people back to work. Supporters of this legislation of auditing the Fed claim they just want to make the Fed's operations and activities more transparent. But we know that's not really what this is about. In a statement in July, the Senate Banking Chair, my colleague in the Banking Committee, the Republican Chair of the Committee, Richard Shelby, hit the nail on the head. Here's what he said. A lot of people called for an audit for the Fed for years, but they already, we already audit the Fed. I don't believe they're just talking about an audit like you'd audit the books of somebody. This is Senator Shelby talking. They're talking about monetary policy. They're talking about 435 members of the House, 100 members of the Senate, getting in the day-to-day -day business of the monetary policy of the Federal Reserve. We created the Fed, Congress did, to get politics as far as we could from the Federal Reserve's monetary policy. I don't believe, he said, we need politics back in the Federal Reserve. Chairman Shelby's right. We don't need 535 members of Congress on the Federal Open Market Committee. One of the most important components we need for sound monetary decision-making policy is political independence. Senator Paul, the sponsor of this, argues that we need to understand, quote, the extent of the Fed's balance sheet. Congress already requires the Federal Reserve to have its financial statements audited every year by an external auditor, someone who is outside and independent, independent of all matters relating to the Fed. The Fed releases a quarterly report presenting detailed information on the Fed's balance sheet and information on the combined financial position and results of operations of the Federal Reserve banks and that report's released to Congress. The report's available to the public on the Fed's website. Anyone can go to federalreserve.gov right now and read it. Each week, the Fed publishes its balance sheet and publishes charts of recent balance sheet trends. And since the crisis, and there are legitimate criticisms of the Federal Reserve, there always have been, there probably always will be because of its reach and its complexity, but since the crisis, the Fed has gotten better. It's gotten better in part because of the last two chairs of the Federal Reserve, uh, Ben Bernanke, a Bush appointee, then an Obama nominee a second time, and with Janet Yellen, an Obama nominee. Uh, since the crisis, the Government Accountability Office has conducted over 100 audits of the Federal Reserve's activities. Many of these audits relate to the financial crisis, include Fed, the Fed's emergency lending activities. And there should be, there is more and there should be more. The Fed is transparent and accountable in the following ways. Let me list them. Again, this isn't just an, an out and out defense of the Fed. They should be open to criticism and there is still much to criticize about them. Uh, but this legislation really solves nothing except to politicize the Fed. The chair is required. These are the ways that the Fed is transparent and accountable. The chair of the Federal Reserve is required to testify before the Senate Banking Committee and the House Financial Services Committee twice a year in monetary policy. In practice, she'll testify at additional hearings on other topics. The governors of the Federal Reserve and senior staff, that's others of the nine members of the Federal Reserve, 
testify dozens more times every year. The Fed releases a statement after each Federal Open Market Committee meeting to describe the FOMC's decisions and the reasoning behind those decisions. The chair holds press conferences four times a year after FOMC meetings. Minutes of FOMC meetings are released three weeks after each meeting and are available on the Federal Reserve's website. Transcripts of FOMC meetings are released earlier than before, five years after each meeting, uh, and available on the Feb's website. As I said, that's much earlier than most other central banks release transcripts for obvious reasons. Summaries of the economic forecasts of FOMC participants, including their projections for the most likely path of the federal funds rate, are released quarterly. The board's office of the inspector general audits and investigates all of the Fed's board, the Fed board and reserve bank programs, operations, and functions. These completed audits and assessments and reviews are listed in the Federal Reserve Board's annual report. The Fed releases detailed transaction level data on the discount window lending and open markets operation. This, was, this is relatively new. This was required by Dodd-Frank Wall Street reform law. So clearly, Congress knew that the Fed was not as responsive, as open as it should be, and one of the things we did in the, the Dodd-Frank was, was uh, this reform. All securities that the Fed holds are published on the Federal Reserve Bank of New York's website. The New York Fed also published the, the most important uh, district regional Federal Reserve. There are 12 of them, including one in the city I live in in Cleveland. Uh, the New York Fed is the most important for a number of reasons. It publishes an annual report of the system open market account that includes a detailed summary of open market operations over the year. It includes balance sheet and income projections. I would add to this chair of the Federal Reserve Reserve um, is more open to the public. Uh, this chair of the Federal Reserve is out and about the country, as her predecessor was, Chairman Bernanke and Chair Yellen even more so. She was at, uh, in Cleveland not too long ago last summer making a speech to the Cleveland City Club, and afterwards she and I went to visit a large Cleveland national manufacturer with a large site in Cleveland so she could see sort of the real economy and talk to workers and see what the, what, what, how important manufacturing is, especially in the middle of the country, uh, to all things Federal Reserve. It goes on and on. I wonder, I wonder, Mr. President, how many of those claiming the Fed is not transparent have actually taken the time to read some of these reports I've mentioned, to read whether it's the um, whether it's the annual report, whether it's some of the audits, whether it's some of the transcripts of FO FOMC. Uh, and I wonder if they've listened to very many of these hours of testimony um, from Chair Yellen or from Governor Torillo uh, or a number of others, Governor, Governor Powell um, or others on the Federal Reserve. The Fed's far from perfect. I have been one of its major critics in this body as the ranking Democrat on banking. But I argue, I argue, for instance, it should be a stronger regulator of the nation's large bank holding companies. I appreciate what it's doing with living wills. I think that's very important. I especially appreciate what the Fed has done for stronger capital standards. That, to me, is the most important thing we can do, more important than reinstatement of Dodd-Frank, more important than my amendment of five years ago to break up the largest banks, making sure that banks have the capital um, significant enough capital to make to to make the the system safer and sounder. It, but it's hard, Mr. President, to dispute that one of the most it's, that, that this Fed is one of the most transparent central banks in the world. So what's this really all about? Uh, I know some people are unhappy about decisions the Federal Reserve made during the financial crisis, including holding interest rates near zero for seven years. They want to show their anger at the Fed by taking away its independence. But without the Fed's extraordinary monetary policy actions, which would have not, which might not have been possible if its actions were micromanaged by Congress, our economy would likely be in a far worse situation today. Several months ago, I was asked by C-SPAN to interview Chairman Bernanke on one of its shows called Book Notes, and we sat for an hour in a studio in Washington and discussed the, the memoir that Chairman Bernanke began to write on the day he left office, left the Federal Reserve a, a couple of years ago. Uh, and it was clear then that because Congress had pursued 
in terms of fiscal policy, such austerity, he saw the economic growth that had started with the auto rescue and the recovery act, he saw that economic growth uh, not immobilized, perhaps it's not the right word, but saw that economic growth stall. And he knew because Congress was starting to squeeze the economy at that point um, with the wrong kind of fiscal policy that he had to make up for it by low interest rates and ultimately by qualitative easement, which is quantitative easement, which is what he did. Uh, so understanding that he knew he would offend some members of Congress uh, with that action, he also understood that because he was independent, he could do the kinds of things as Chair Yellen has been able to do uh, to get this economy growing. Hence, in large part because of the auto rescue, but in large part because of QE, that the Federal Reserve has done through the last two chairs of the Federal Reserve, one a Republican appointee, one a Democratic appointee, the Fed has been independent enough to do the right thing. Inflation remains low. We have a, something called a dual mandate where the Federal Reserve is responsible for working to keep inflation at no more than 2 percent and unemployment at no more than 5 percent. And the Fed has balanced that well. Inflation remains low, despite the doomsday prediction by many of this bill's proponents. We know that our economy still has a way to go, and that too many Americans are struggling. But it's clear that increase in interest rates before last month would have been premature and would have been harmful to working Americans. If Congress were involved in that, in the way that the sponsor of this bill seems to want, uh, our economy would be in much worse shape. I don't think there's much question about that. Auto the Fed legislation is also a backdoor piecemeal way of instituting something called the Taylor Rule, which is an attempt to impose a monetary policy role on the Fed. This is really the heart, to me, of this legislation, that when they look at the dual mandate, they think way more about inflation um, which is what the bondholders in Wall Street want them to do, and way less about fiscal policy and way less about low interest rates and way less about employment. So the dual mandate, again, is inflation and employment. If you err, if you lean far too much towards inflation, which again is what Wall Street wants, uh, then people in Main Street are left out. And that's been, frankly, the story of the Fed for far too many years. That's why what Chairman Bernanke did and what Chairwoman Yellen has done is so important. But if audit the Fed, the audit the Fed sponsors have their way, um, we'll see some kind of Taylor rule. In November, House Republicans passed a Federal Reserve reform bill that imposes a Taylor rule. The enforcement mechanism, GAO reviews, audits, and reports. Is there any doubt this is where the audit the Fed effort is headed, headed next. I urge my colleagues to vote no this afternoon. This vote will take place in a couple of hours. It's in all of our, it's in the interest of all of us to understand the role and the operations and the activities of the Federal Reserve. We can do that better in this body. This is not the way to do it. We can do it better. But it's also in the interest of the American economy for Congress to keep its political hands, if you will, out of monetary policy decision making. If Republicans were really serious about making the Fed work better, they would confirm the two pending nominees to the Board of Governors. A Republican community banker named Al Landon has been waiting for a nomination hearing for a year. And Catherine Dominguez, a Democratic nominee, has been waiting for nearly six months. Yet instead of working to improve the Fed's operations, we're considering this bill to undermine it. It's a big mistake uh, that uh, most people I know that have any expertise in the Federal Reserve reject. I ask my colleagues to vote no. Mr. President. The Senator from Kentucky. I rise today in opposition to secrecy. I rise today in support of auditing the Federal Reserve. I rise in opposition to the lack of accountability of the Federal Reserve, an institution that has for too long been shrouded in secrecy. The objective of the Federal Reserve Transparency Act is simple, to protect the interests of the average American by finding out where hundreds of billions of dollars worth are going. The Federal Reserve has the ability to create new money and to spend it on whatever financial assets it wants, whenever it wants, while giving the new money to whichever banks it wants. Yet if the average Joe and Jane from Main Street printed their own money, they would be imprisoned as counterfeiters. Nowhere else but in Washington, D.C. would you find an institution with so much unchecked power.
Creating new money naturally lowers interest rates or the price of using money. Put another way, the Federal Reserve's unchecked printing press creates a price control on the cost of using money. Throughout our country's history, price controls have never worked, and the Fed's price control on interest rates has also not worked. Think back to the housing bubble. Artificially low interest rates led to many individuals buying, selling, and investing in the housing industry. This, in turn, led prices to soar, which ultimately led the economy to spiral down to the Great Recession of 2008. Since the 2008 financial crisis, the Fed has increased its balance sheet from less than $1 trillion to over $4 trillion. Although the Fed has created trillions of new dollars, it has become apparent that most of this money is not finding its way into the hands of average Americans. From 2009 to 2012, the incomes of the top 1% increased by a whopping 31%, while everyone else's income increased by only 0.4%. The reason for this is simple. Big banks, corporations, and government entities receive the Federal Reserve's money long before anyone else. And they bid up the prices of assets before the rest of us can get to purchase them. Former Federal Reserve Governor Kevin Warsh once referred to the Fed's easy money policy as the reverse Robin Hood effect. If you have access to credit, if you've got a big balance sheet, the Fed has made you richer. This is a way to make the well-to-do even more well-to-do. The side effect of this uneven distribution of money is painfully apparent to anyone who shops at a grocery store. Over the past 15 years, the price of white bread has increased by over 50%, while the price of eggs has more than doubled. The cost of housing has also appreciated significantly in many areas. When adjusting for inflation, the price of housing in San Francisco has increased by 58% over just 25 years. Real household income for regular Americans has declined 10% over the past 15 years. Higher rent and higher grocery bills cause lower income workers to incur more loans and credit card debt, which involve far higher interest rates than what the banks and Wall Street are currently paying. These low income workers do not get the luxury of receiving the Fed's newly created money first, nor do they have the luxury of receiving the near zero interest rates that the wealthy do. As a result, one thing is for certain. The Fed's price control on interest rates acts as a hidden tax on the less well-to-do. The Fed also exacerbates income inequality by paying large commercial banks $12 billion in interest. This is a departure from nearly a century of practice. While individual savers earn practically no interest, the big banks are given $12 billion per year in interest. There's a revolving door often between the Fed, the Treasury, and Wall Street. It's a revolving door in a building that is all too eager to enrich big banks and asset holders at the expense of everyone else. I think it's about time we pull back the curtain to uncover this cloak of secrecy once and for all. Who is receiving the loans from the Fed today? Who is the Fed paying interest to? Are there any conflicts of interest about how these payments are determined? Are there any checks and balances on the size of these payments? The Federal Reserve Act actually forbids the Fed from buying some of the troubled assets that it bought in 2008, yet they did it anyway. Given all these unanswered questions, and given the sharp increase in the risk of the Fed's balance sheet, it is unquestionably necessary for the Fed to be audited more thoroughly than it has in the past. Audit the Fed is just three pages long, and it simply says that the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, which is a nonpartisan, apolitical agency in charge, that they be allowed to audit the Fed, a full and thorough audit. Currently, the GAO is not allowed to audit the Fed's monetary policy deliberations or the Fed's open market committee transactions. The GAO was also forbidden from reviewing agreements with foreign central banks, 
During the downturn in 2008, trillions of dollars were spent, much of it or quite a bit of it on foreign banks, and we are not allowed to know what occurred, to whom this was given, and for what purpose. The Fed audit in its current form is virtually futile. When these restrictions were added to the audit in the 1970s, the GAO testified before Congress saying, we do not see how we can satisfactorily audit the Federal Reserve without the authority to examine its largest single category of financial transactions and assets. To grasp just how limited the current audit is, recall that in 2009, Democratic Congressman Alan Grayson asked then-Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke which foreign countries received $500 billion in loans from the Fed. Bernanke was unwilling to name which countries or banks received a half trillion dollars worth of funds. That's right, the Fed swapped a half a trillion dollars to foreign countries in secret and did not even have the decency under testimony before Congress to report the details. But it gets worse. Democratic Senator Bernie Sanders also asked Bernanke who received $2.2 trillion that the Fed lent out during the financial crisis. Again, Bernanke refused to give a direct answer. In the 2011 Dodd-Frank law, Congress ordered a limited one-time GAO audit of Fed actions. During the financial crisis, that audit uncovered that the Fed lent out over $16 trillion to domestic and foreign banks during the financial crisis. Mr. President, could I ask uh, unanimous consent for an extra five minutes? Is there objection? Senator Miles. Mr. Senator Paul, how much time do we have? I'd be happy to ask unanimous consent for equal time. Uh, Senator Paul's time has expired. The majority's time I, I has expired. Need, Mr. President, I only need five minutes, so I'm willing to cede whatever remains so he can have enough time. He's second. But I would like to reserve five minutes, and I lift my objection. Well, the unanimous consent would be to have five extra minutes and to give you as much time as you need to conclude. Okay. Without objection. Senator from Kentucky. Both Republicans and Democrats agree that it is absurd that we do not know where hundreds of billions of dollars worth of our money is going. In fact, last year, my audit, the Fed bill, received the support of nearly every Republican in the House and over 100 Democrats. Some say that an audit will politicize the Fed. I find this claim odd, given both sides of the aisle's support for the bill. The GAO is nonpartisan, independent, works for Congress. It does not lean Republican or Democrat, and it is not interested in influencing policy. I can't seem to understand how a simple check by the GEO to ensure that there are no conflicts of interest will politicize anything. Instead of criticizing a standard audit, though, maybe the individuals who work at the Fed and within our central bank should begin curbing their own actions. Unlike the actions of current Fed officials, my bipartisan bill will not politicize anything. I simply want to over, it overseen, the Fed overseen, to ensure that our central bank isn't picking favorites, and I want to ensure that it remains solvent. Like every agency, the Federal Reserve was created by Congress and is supposed to be overseen by Congress. Auditing the Fed should not be a partisan issue. Regardless of one's monetary policy views, regardless of whether you think interest rates should be higher or lower, everyone can and should agree that for the sake of the country's economic well-being, we need to know what has been going on behind the Federal Reserve's cloak of secrecy. It's time we quit this guessing game. It's time we audit the Federal Reserve once and for all to restore transparency to our nation's checkbook. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator from Ohio. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise uh, to oppose the audit the Fed bill. I, you know, one of the things around here that we learned is new members, uh, new members of the House and Senate, and I served with the presiding officer almost my entire time in the House, and we all learned this, is if you can name the bills around here, you have tremendous advantage. Call the, call the estate tax, the death tax, even though about 1% of Americans pay it. 
Uh, you may have won the debate, call this bill audit the Fed, and how can you be against auditing the Fed? You may win the debate, but um, this time I don't think so. I, I'm, concerned, I'm concerned in this way. It won't make the Fed stronger. It won't make the Fed more effective. It won't make the Fed more accountable. It will impair the Fed, Fed, Fed's functions. It will give conservative members of Congress more tools to second guess the Fed's decision making, and it makes the system ultimately less sound, flexible, and responsive. I think if you think about what happened in 2009, President Obama took office, we we're losing 800,000 jobs a month. Congress passed uh, the, um, the Recovery Act, passed the auto rescue, which mattered so much to the presiding officer's state in my state, and frankly to the senator from Kentucky, to his state too. Um, but then, with the change in, con in the, the, the elections of 2010, this Congress engaged in austerity, and we saw what that meant. It took a, a uh, Bush-appointed Federal Reserve Chair, Ben Bernanke, who engaged in enough pump priming, if you will, through, for, through low interest rates and then QE to get the economy going. Would we have wanted, I think we ask ourselves, would we have wanted a Federal Reserve then where Congress had its tentacles in, in monetary policy? Congress failed in fiscal policy. Chairman Bernanke and now Chair, Chair Yellen have had to move on on, on monetary policy in that way, and I don't want to straightjacket this Congress and straightjacket the Federal Reserve by doing that with Congress. I, I know some of you have supported audit bills in the past. Many supported the Dodd-Sanders Amendment during Wall Street reform, but this one's different. It doesn't include provisions to review the independent foreclosure review program pro process. It doesn't include protections on some of the sensitive information that GO, GAO could review, like transcripts. What this is about, Mr. President, in addition to Congress meddling in monetary policy, is ultimately this. We know that the Fed is charged with a dual mandate uh, to balance, to deal with the tension between combating inflation and combating unemployment. We know that in, in past years, the Fed has leaned far more towards the bondholders in Wall Street in combating inflation than it has towards Main Street in employment and cutting, cut, combating unemployment. We also know that with the pressures in this town, when President Obama signed Wall Street reform, uh, the, the chief lobbyist for the financial services industry said it's now halftime, meaning that conservative members of this Congress, people in this Congress influenced by Wall Street, would immediately go and try to weaken these rules in the, going directly to the agencies. We'll see the same thing here. We'll see Congress, many members of Congress, pushing the Fed to side with the bondholders in Wall Street on combating inflation rather than siding with Main Street and small businesses and workers in dealing with unemployment. That's fundamentally the biggest problem with the Paul proposal. I ask my colleagues to defeat it. And I yield back my time, President. All time has been yielded back. The clerk will now report the motion to invoke cloture. Cloture motion. We, the undersigned senators, in accordance with the provisions of Rule 22 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, do hereby move to bring to a close debate on the motion to proceed to calendar number 289, S2232, a bill to require a full audit of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System and the Federal Reserve Banks by the Comptroller General of the United States and for other purposes, signed by 17 senators. By unanimous consent, the mandatory quorum call has been waived. The question is, is it the sense of the Senate that debate on the motion to proceed to S2232 a bill to require a full audit of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System and the Federal Reserve Banks by the Comptroller General of the United States and for other purposes shall be brought to a close. The yeas and nays are, under, are mandatory under this rule. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Alexander, Ms. Ayotte, Ms. Baldwin, Mr. Barrasso, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Blunt, Mr. Booker, Mr. Bozeman, Mrs. Boxer, Mr. Brown, Mr. Burr. <coughs> Ms. Cantwell. <laughs> 
Mrs. Capito. Mr. Cardin. Mr. Carper. Mr. Casey. Mr. Cassidy. Mr. Coates. Mr. Cochran. Ms. Collins. Mr. Coons. Mr. Corker. Mr. Cornyn. Mr. Cotton. Mr. Crapo. Mr. Cruz. Mr. Danes. Mr. Donnelly. Mr. Durbin. Mr. Inzi. Mrs. Ernst. Mrs. Feinstein. Mrs. Fisher. Mr. Flake. Mr. Franken. Mr. Gardner. Mrs. Gillibrand. Mr. Graham. Mr. Grassley. Mr. Hatch. Mr. Heinrich. Ms. Heitkamp. Mr. Heller. Ms. Hirono. Mr. Hoven. Yes, sir. Mr. Inhoff. Sullivan, I. Mr. Isaacson. Mr. Johnson. Mr. Kane. Mr. King. Mr. Kirk. Ms. Klobuchar. Mr. Lankford. Mr. Leahy. Mr. Lee. Mr. Manchin. Mr. Markey. Mr. McCain. Mrs. McCaskill. Mr. McConnell. Mr. Menendez. Mr. Merkley. Ms. Mikulski. Mr. Moran. Ms. Murkowski. Mr. Murphy. Mrs. Murray. Mr. Nelson. Mr. Paul. Mr. Purdue. Mr. Peters. Mr. Portman. Mr. Reed of Rhode Island. Mr. Reed of Nevada. Mr. Risch. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Rounds. Mr. Rubio. Mr. Sanders. Mr. Sass. Mr. Schatz. Mr. Schumer. Mr. Scott. Mr. Sessions. Mrs. Shaheen. Mr. Shelby. Ms. Stabenow.
Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Tester. Mr. Thune. Mr. Tillis. Mr. Toomey. Mr. Udall. Mr. Vitter. Mr. Warner. Ms. Warren. Mr. Whitehouse. Mr. Wicker. Mr. Wyden. Senators voting in the affirmative. Blunt, Burr, Cassidy, Collins, Crapo, Grassley, Inhoff, Isaacson, Paul, Portman, Sullivan, Tillis, and Vitter. Senators voting in the negative. Bennett, Blumenthal, Booker, Boxer, Brown, Casey, Coons, Feinstein, Gillibrand.
Mr. Sanders, aye. Have all senators voted? Any senators wish to change their vote or to vote? Not on this vote. The yeas are 53, the nays are 44. Three fifths of the senators duly chosen and sworn not having voted in the affirmative. The motion is not agreed to. Mr. President. Senator from Utah. 